Yep. Lovely. All right. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Richard. Um, Fantastic. So, uh, uh, Go, go ahead. I'll <laughs> this is this is the only problem with running a virtual event. <laughs> I, can't, I can't see your face now. I never can't take any visual cues. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you're never quite sure. Um, uh, I'll just I'll welcome everybody quickly. Um, uh, we've got an hour. It normally goes over because uh, uh, our audience have got so many incredible questions. Um, just to thank you all for coming. Um, we have um, Tim Ebenezer tonight. Um, really, really interesting talk, especially given that we never have, um, or we haven't for ages, had um, a talk about web. Um, I'll let Tim um, Tim give you his background and um, what he's talking about today, just to say that um, he's currently the Chief Digital Officer of um, Foundation SP. Um, but he's had um, a very, very strong Microsoft history. We've just been chatting about this for um, for the last uh, half an hour. So I think um, I'm sure he's going to pepper stuff with lots of interesting stories. But um, I'm really looking forward to um, to having um, to having a, a talk about web uh, and Azure, which we haven't had in ages. So I'll hand over to Tim now. Lovely. Thank you, Richard. Really appreciate it. And um, Good to be uh, joining you all um, on this uh, Azure uh, user group. Um, thank you, thank you, Richard, for, for sort of uh, um, uh, yeah hosting this. And uh, I, I think I think you said this this pizza is going to everybody's house. So who's uh, involved in the user group as you sort of, sort of normally have in a uh, in a gathering? Uh, <laughs> that, that, that really would be quite an effort. But I think that sounds amazing. <laughs> I love it. Somebody came up with a service to do that. That would be the the traditional pizza as a service model that people well, came exactly. up with to describe IaaS and PaaS. <laughs> that, that's it. You know, we're talking cloud. We've got to talk pizza as a service. So. Um, as 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 Richard said, I'm from a uh, from a company called FSP, where I'm chief digital officer. Um, we're a Microsoft partner uh, involved in the cloud space. Um, maybe a little bit more lowbrow than uh, than some of uh, some of our other Microsoft partner um, community colleagues. Uh, you know, we're we're just talking about web today rather than sort of highfalutin uh, uh, data science, etc. But uh, we we do we do have data capability that we uh, that we work into and a, and a cloud capability as well as um, Office 365 capability that we work in. But something that's been really interesting for us in the in the last um, number of months, only the last sort of uh, three to six months, has been um been Microsoft's uh, pushing out of Blazor as part of uh, the you know the new releases of ASP.NET uh, Core and uh, seeing how that works in in enterprise capabilities you know um we we really like to push the envelope on uh, using new technology and 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 pushing that new new is new is better than old um in in many cases I mean Richard and I were just sort of reminiscing on um on Azure back in 2009 when it was pretty much just a uh just a, a blob storage service and I think that I, I always remember the three things that they had then but the only one that sticks in my mind is blob storage um, and I just sort of looked at it and, you know, this will never catch on and uh, now here we are 10 11 years later and certainly it's caught on um, so definitely uh, focus on, on new is uh, new is better than old concept and uh, so Blazor come and uh, in, in places you know has reinvented um, how, how Microsoft thinks about uh, sort of web uh, systems again, but there's a really strong link to Azure and what sort of a well architected or uh, typically architected um, Blazor uh, application in Azure, and that's a little bit of what I want to talk about today. So I'll just take you through a very quick sort of um, uh, overview. I'll try to stick to you know to, to doing this quite quickly so a bit of an overview of what is blazer how does it sort of compare with other web frameworks um a little bit about uh how it interacts uh with azure and what a good architecture good is maybe the wrong term what a typical uh, common architecture for a blazer application might look like and how it can interact with a number of uh azure services and then just a real quick demonstration it's not going to be an exhaustive demonstration of blazer I realize many of you might not be uh, developers by trade, so I've tried to focus on uh, areas of where it interacts with, um, with with Azure and and how that's done, and especially where it's a little bit unusual. So where the uh, the, the the model that, that the Blazor uses, which I'll talk about a bit in a moment, where that sort of um, uh, introduces some challenges, but also how 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 we've got around them, and then you know probably where I think you know we we'd be 
you know a, a, a little further forward than, than many other partners we've de we've deployed blaze in production contexts a number of times and uh, got a little bit of sort of information on, on what we've seen and particularly some of the um, some of the services that you use with blazer how you might um, see those behaving and you know we've all I'm sure run up against um, Microsoft's uh, somewhat arbitrary um, uh, 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 resource units for for different uh, for different Azure services, whether that's in uh, Cosmos or DTUs in uh, Urban, trying to figure out well what does a DTU actually mean. So a bit of well, in reality, what does a Blazor application look like, and how could I think about scaling it with some of the services we use? I'll jump into a little bit of that, and then and then leave plenty of time for Q and A at the end. Um, hopefully, you know, this is a relatively simple simple talk, so um, there'll be plenty of time if there's any questions at the end. But just very quickly, a little bit about me. Um, won't, won't, won't bore you with lots of details. Um, Chief Digital Officer at Foundation SP, as, uh, as Richard mentioned. Uh, I lead all of our technical teams here um, and all of our, uh, all of our all of our client delivery. I've been involved in software development for, for 20 years. Um, I was an open source founder early in, in early 2000s. So if any of you ever came across something called Wix, which was Microsoft's first ever foray into open source technology. It was the um, Windows installer toolkit. Um, I was the creator of something called Wix GUI, which was a, uh, a, a um, graphical user interface that wrapped around Wix. Was one of my far less successful open source projects. Um, but been been involved with uh, with a few over the years, and then kept kept my hand in with uh, with software development and um, sort of moving through web systems, uh, worked on CAD systems and all sorts in the past. Um, but yeah, very passionate about software development. Uh, married with two kids, which is um, fun in, in lockdown. Um, fortunately, they're of an age where they can play Xbox for extended periods. Um, and so, something interesting about me, if you go on my Twitter, which the handle is below, you'll see me uh, sort of uh, playing around with my musical instruments if you sort of scroll through for, for long enough and uh, something that I'm very passionate about. I don't know if my background's blurred, but you might see a drum kit behind me if, it, if it's not. So very, uh, very pleased to be sort of speaking about uh, about Blazor and really something I'm passionate about. So very quickly, we jump into what is Blazor? What, what, what is it? Well, Blazor is a framework to build interactive web UIs with C Sharp. So it's got two modes of operation, if you like. Um, so what you can think of Blazor is Microsoft's response to the, the uh, growth and proliferation of frameworks like React, uh, Angular, uh, and other front-end um, <clears throat> front frameworks uh, in JavaScript. And I guess what they've tried to address with, with Blazor is the fact that uh, front-end uh, or C-sharp developers are having to, you know, Get familiar with another uh, another language, uh, in in this case JavaScript, in order to do effective client side coding. Um, and so it's built on ASP.NET, requires no plugins on the client side, but um, can create interactive web UIs. And I'll show you a bit of what that sort of looks like. But effectively, what it gives you is, if any of you are familiar with web forms from back in the day, is actually when you know the first time um, you use Blazor, you feel like you're stepping back in time and using web forms. But it's a lot cleverer in how it in, in how it works. So um, there's two modes of operation for Blazor. It can either compile down to WebAssembly, WASM, um, or it can use Signaler to run server side. And those two the two modes of operation dictate how you then build your application. So if you compile 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 down to WASM, that whole uh, binary gets loaded into the client side, um, and Effectively, though the work that Microsoft still need to do, why it still sits in preview on the WASM version, whilst the Signaler server server side version is now production ready or or, or sorry, uh, standard release ready. Um, on in the WASM version, it downloads binary uh, onto the uh, into the user uh, browser, and then runs code natively in the browser, making changes on the client side, and all of that's coded up in C sharp. So what that means is, you know can if you're for example using entity framework um, as your uh, object relationship man, um, uh, mapping system um, you can use your entity framework models directly from your front end code and you know you've not got the uh, if any of you have used sort of uh, javascript uis you've you know javascript um, 
frameworks. You've not got the data transfer objects that you have to have ferrying data in between and copies of your objects on you know, or representations of your objects in the JavaScript framework and on your C sharp uh, server side. So um, the other mode of operation is where it uses Signaler to run server side. So in this mode, um, the application runs on a server very much like a you know, normal SP.NET MVC application or a uh, Razor Pages application, if you're familiar with either of those. Um, but then what's clever that happens is when you connect to the application, a signal section is established between the server and the client, and then only diffs in the pages HTML is sent from, uh, from server to client. So what you have then is you can you know, essentially make changes and uh, modify your HTML on the fly. It totally respects any C sharp object and it just sends diffs as state changes within your application. Very rich, very quick, but also means you're just constantly interacting directly with your C sharp objects and you're never seeing any, you know, you're not messing around with any any JavaScript. It does support interop with JavaScript if you do need to do um, you know, do some uh, some things that, that are outside of its capability, which I'll talk about a little bit in a moment. But just to be clear, this first session focusing on the server side piece, the client side piece is in preview. It's not recommended at the moment for enterprise use or for production use, um, but definitely one to watch for the future in terms of we think about, you know, good, good Azure architecture, serverless architectures definitely leans in that direction in the future. So now it's still a web app. Good for serverless in the future once we get to that WASM state, if you like. And then just a very quick comparison to JavaScript frameworks um, in terms of the pros. Yeah, the, the main one, which has always been, you know, if we, if we think back to, uh, to, to to web forms in, uh, in in the old days, you know, Microsoft did really try to do as much as possible through um, uh, through uh, through C sharp code and through uh, the awful awful user control model that existed within web forms. And if anybody uh, thinks of update panels and what that sort of meant. Um, so update panels were a way of doing early um, asynchronous JavaScript calls um, and Microsoft sort of wrapped it all in this thing um, that, that did it all by magic, but with lots of uh, with lots of load in your um, on your front end and your back end. Um, it was it was a mess. Very similar concept, but executed much better uh, in, 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 in effect. Um, so no need to learn another language and paradigm for developers. And that's the big one, you know. Um, in addition, direct use of ORMs such as an entity framework, as I've mentioned, and less need for DCOs. Uh, but on the con side, visual effects are much harder to achieve in Blazor. So if you want anything that looks like a, you know, something fairly simple that you could do in, in a JavaScript framework, like fade a div in and out, you know, with Blazor, you can't do that or if you do to have to do something clever with css3 transitions alternatively you can use javascript interop in order to um sort of make calls off to uh, to, to javascript uh, frameworks or functions to do that and there is you know the, there is the option of mixing and matching some of these you know some of these javascript frameworks with with blazor as well um the second one just to be aware of is um, if you're using the WASM version, the WebAssembly version of um, of Blazor, is that WebAssembly doesn't support or is not supported by IE 11. So there is a, a shim for that called ASM.js, but um, the performance will be, you know, will, will be severely impacted. I mean, um, we're not, you know, we're not talking about the days of IE 6 when we had to, you know, support and test things on, you know, literally, tens of browsers before before we push things in when it was i876 x y and z and uh, and uh, netscape navigator and three that we had to check things on you know so not not quite as bad as that but ie 11 definitely an alive and well browser where you know this this may not work so well so a bit of um a bit of context there in terms of blazer what it does for to be very clear, Blaze is a separate approach from Razor Pages, is a separate approach from MVC. There are ways to mix and match them, um, and they can be used together potentially, but um, in reality, Blazor has its own routing engine. It has its own um, uh, way of working that works best you know, in, in isolation. And you know, there's, uh, you know, it, it can certainly 
uh, it can certainly be organised and architected in such a way that it's um, you know, as suitable um, uh, for uh, for sort of production scenarios as 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 MVC or or, or Razor Pages would be. So getting into then okay blazer and azure so what does that actually look like so um got a very simple very simplistic high level architecture as an example um in terms of how we might uh we might think of uh how we might think of blazer and how it might lay down as a um as an enterprise application um so in many ways this is not dissimilar to how we would think of you know a an ASB on MVC application in terms of how we would manage secrets using Key Vault uh, in the bottom right hand corner. So using that to uh, uh, store any secrets we had, um, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a best practice manner. Um, using App Insights to, uh, to 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 log data and to be able to, you know, um, alert and monitor where where necessary where necessary. Uh, where necessary. Um, using app registrations for um, for for B two B uh um uh, uh authentication um and then using a variety of data sources be it sort of azure sql cosmos blob storage i guess the the interesting thing is the interaction into these again if you're thinking about the comparison with uh perhaps if you were using a react application rather than an asp not an mvc application you get the benefits of having a rich front end uh, with the you know combined with the ability to use you know rather than using a uh, you know a, a library like msal or adal uh, js in order to talk to your app registrations and to talk through to azure active directory you know you can use the the adal or microsoft identity um, client directly from c sharp code to do all of that uh, to do all of that integration and the you know associated middleware that comes with um, that comes with uh, uh, with the ASP.NET Core um, uh, 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 dependency injection uh, functionality that you have within 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 an ASP.NET Core application, so a really sort of straightforward way of working from a developer perspective and from a um, from a workflow perspective, but with the same experience that you'd see for an end user in terms of you know if you were doing it with a with a flow on the uh, on the React side and having that rich um that rich, rich web interface um equally you know again another mode of operation uh, is for the blazor app to talk off to um functions apps and, and and logic apps indeed either in order to um you know uh talk to line of business systems or in order to gain access to data sources um definitely comes more into play with talking about a full serverless architecture with you know Blazor single page application uh, combined down uh, compiled down to WebAssembly in the you know in the client side model pushed out you know that could be served rather than being served through an app service you know that could be served through um, through blob storage and through um, through surfacing of, of 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 websites through blob storage um, and then calling off to function apps for their um, uh, for the for the application logic and for uh, interaction with data sources but. In this case, talking about sort of the server side, the other key part that I haven't touched on there is the SignalR service, which you see off to the side. Probably the one service that I imagine many would have come into less contact with uh, out of all of these that I've put uh, put up here. Uh, I'm sure everyone's very familiar with uh, with Azure SQL, Cosmos, Function Apps, etc. But the SignalR service is a um, a hosted service um, for Signaler applications uh, to use that, that allow essentially point-to-point -point connections between client and server applications, and 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 runs that as a as a PaaS service effectively, um, and it's a key part of clearly a Blazor application. Rather than running that within your app service as a service on the VM that's running your app service, you run that within the Signaler service, and that gives you a level of scalability, control, and predictability that's um, that, that's really beneficial when running in this uh, in this scenario. Um, and then the last piece, of course, you know, per, per good practice, um, you know, uh, repositories, pipelines feeding into that app service directly. Um, again, providing that full sort of Azure ecosystem uh, for Blazor application, but very much the same way you'd approach it um, uh, if you were if you were um, you know architecting a, um, a Razor Pages or, or MVC application uh, in in terms of how you'd lay it lay it down in terms of uh, app service app service plan etc. 
So that's just a very quick sort of whistle stop tour of the types of components you could uh, you could interact with. Um, but I thought what's what's probably most crucial is for um, you know, you know to, to to think about what the things we uh, we have to watch for when we're when we're deploying Blazor in an enterprise environment um, that, that involves Azure. So um, firstly, scaling the signal in our service is really important. Um, so again, as I mentioned, it's sort of a, a service that like other uh, like, like other Microsoft uh, services like, like SQL Azure, you know, has a, a units um, measure attached to it. Um, and those units represent a different amount of connections, a different amount of um, messages that can be sent by signal R, but is it's very hard to sort of calculate necessarily well how many messages how many connections does a blazer application consume so again we'll give you some real life um uh, uh data on that uh, towards the end of the towards the end of the session um handling large file uploads can be prone to errors so if you think about how blazer works in the server side um a way of working um what you have is signal R which talks in effectively um, small packets uh, and is relatively chatty between um, uh, between uh, a server and client. I mean, you've got sort of 32K packets and so if anything is more than 32K to take, you know, a, a lot of, um, you know, a, a lot of network messages and can be uh, can be subject to uh, subject to, to latency. So there's a piece around um, yeah, making sure that you one thing you can do is increase the size of your signal packets, um, which which can help. Um, the other piece is you, you know you can do a stream through. Um, and whilst that still you know, uses uses the signal R service um, rather than you know, writing down to the um, uh, writing down and persisting to the to the environment app service within which the uh, the Blazor application is sitting. At least you get, and, and then having to wait for a secondary uh, a secondary push, uh, you at least have that streaming right through, and you see that uh, you see that effect. Um, so yeah, something that we've sort of come across a number of times is this large large file uploads being prone to errors, and really yeah, how, how to work around that and making sure that works uh, works effectively. Um, but you know, we've 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 tried this pattern now up to sort of files of of, of half a gig. Uh, even a gig, I think, and 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 had no no issues with, uh, with 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 uploading files in the way we'll uh, I'll sort of run through in a moment. Then uh, logging off to App Insights um, really important. So um, if you're not, uh, you know, if, if you've got thrown errors that aren't being uh, that aren't being uh, caught and and something done with them, um, the application can go from a front end from a user perspective into a sort of uh, stasis where the ground. Um, and nothing appears to happen until they then. Um, and so actually catching log in using that as part of your um, uh, application uh, sort of cycle is, is, is really important. And yeah, you know, like web forms, uh, again, you know, thinking back to, uh, you know, when, when we all had to know inside out the page life cycle and we all had to think about on in it and if on in it was called before on load and, and all of those good things that uh, probably have just uh, sent a bunch of you into 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 you know, into into cold sweats. Um, you do need to think about the request and page lifecycle uh, in Blazor. It's not uh, it's not anywhere near as painful as um, <clears throat> as as Web Forms was. It doesn't suffer from uh, you know, some of the issues we had around uh, view state and all of those uh, all of those good things uh, and and that big. A 64 encoded string that we'd have sitting at the top of every page. None, none of that, but still very much a page life cycle that is, uh, you know, that is carried out. And, and there's this mix of um, synchronous and asynchronous events, and you do need to think about that. And you know, where you carry some, you know, where, where you carry out actions synchronously versus asynchronously. Um, but you know, again, a, a common problem in the, you know, in the in the in the new web age, uh, definitely. And uh, yeah, so it uses standard uh, .NET Core dependency injection, but something to watch out with is interactions with some of the um, some of the services can be a little bit unusual. So if we think back to how server side Blazor works, what happens is a you know if you if you have a on click um, uh, event within a button, for example, in HTML, that will trigger a, uh, a an event on the on the on the client side, which then gets passed back to the server side and gets called. You know, some code gets called. 
on the server side, it's keeping a record of what it believes the HTML state of your end client is, and then it sends the diff back of that of, of the previous state versus the new state after you've clicked this button back to your client. Oh, and then your client, uh, the the JavaScript, uh, the Blazor uh, JavaScript runtime at the uh, at the client end, then populates that into the page. And what you find with that is there are a few components um, that can behave. Um, in not the normal manner you would expect um, with uh, when when you know, when you're using a uh, you know a .NET MVC um, application for example where everything is a request and you know there's a, there's a proper request life cycle so you know you're you're only actually in in Blazor making a single request um, or a, a single get request if you start after that everything else is a signal R call so a um, yeah a, 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 a effectively a, a web sockets call at that point point so actually some of those uh, some of those um, uh, dotnet core services or components which uh, you know rely on the request life cycle you have to think about whether you have to you know call them directly in order to get the benefit so just, just something to something to keep aware of so talked enough about blazer i think uh, probably worth just showing you what it is um, and 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 very quickly how it interacts with some of the um, some of the Azure capabilities. So um, if I uh, if I fire up this application, so um, this is where hopefully it all still works. Um, I was tinkering a little bit before uh, before five o'clock. Um, so basic uh, basic de uh, Blazor demo. So you'll recognise this as a very basic bootstrap bootstrap page. Um, so what's happening here is the request, as I explained, has happened now. It's it's gone and got um, the the home page. And now any click I do from this point will be handled by Blazor, and Blazor will be doing this diffing behind the scenes to be um, to be um, uh, uh, presenting me with with new versions of the web page. So uh, as a as sort of a demonstration of that, if we um, if I look at this EF data piece, um, I've got a simple a simple table here with a Add person button, which I can click on, and I can go in and I can say I'm going to add Richard in here, and Richard Richard looks like he's about 25, and I'll submit that, and that's now saved. And just to you know check that that's actually persisted the database or refresh, and as it loads up the page, it shows me that that's still pulling out the database. So now what's happening behind the scenes? Then it's it's easier to probably show it this way round is. Um, what I've got behind behind here is a um, is a um, a Blazor application within which sits a number of uh, a number of components, um, so a number of folders. Um, those of you familiar with ASP.NET uh, Core will see the startup file, which is a normal ASP.NET uh, Core startup file, which contains all my services and all of that uh, all of that good stuff, or .NET Core startup file, I should say, which contains all of that uh, all of that. And we've got a pages folder, which contains a number of Razor pages. And within a Razor page definition, right at the top, there's a or Blazor page definition, I should say. Sorry, um, there's a definition for what route uh, maps to it. So the very first thing is that this this page, this Blazor page, is at EF core. So if I look back in here, that's the EF core route that's sitting here. So that's what's rendering this page here. <clears throat> um, as I go back in, you'll see there's some HTML here now. There is a templating feature around this. I'm not going to dive too much into this, uh, but um, as you, you know, as you open up a Blazor application, you'll see it sort of builds on templates which drop components inside, you know, in, in, inside a template. So you've got the the framing component, if you like, which is showing all of the nav views, etc., on the side. But what I've got here is some basic HTML, and then I've got a simple if statement that says if my people um, uh, collection is null. Show me a loading spinner. Otherwise, show me that table. And that's all I'm doing in there. And then what I've got is some code behind. So again, very much like um, very much like um, uh, web forms. Um, I'm inheriting up here from EF core base, which is my class I've def defined in this code behind. And you'll see on the initialized asynchronous method, I'm going off to my data context. This is an EF core data context. I'm grabbing the people list. And I'm turning that into a list as asynchronously. So as soon as that happens, as soon as that 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 collection turns into not null, the HTML automatically changes from 
a loading spinner into the data. And that's a really important concept with, with, with Blazor. So we're in here, all I need to do is say, is people null or not? And at the point it's not null, I can rely that my HTML will turn into the HTML down here. And similarly, I'm then iterating over that people collection and populating the rows. And so what you'll see is when I added uh, when I added uh, Richard into the um, uh, into the uh, into the table here, and I'll add Andy in here now. As soon as the um, as soon as I've persisted off and saved that and submitted that and it's into that collection, it's automatically adding that row in the table. And so again, really important concept of Blazor is very, very easy to interact with data to display that, to edit it, etc. Et all, all using very typical, um, you know, typical C sharp techniques. Last one I'll show you very quickly is how the add person piece works. You see there's a button at the bottom called add person. In here I've got a little um, at sign before the on click method. It says uh, on click call the add person method. So if I go into that, that's simply a, uh, a C sharp, um, a C sharp method which is all it's doing is it's setting this adding flag to true rather than false and you'll see in my ef core uh, sorry my ef core blazer uh, component when adding is true so i'm saying if adding up here i just add another row into the table and that's what's making happen as soon as i click in here add person it adds another row into that table and so simply through changing that one variable it detects what changes are needed in the html and it pushes that through to the client really really simple really rich and as you can see I'm able to use my EF core classes etc and, uh, and 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 use that to my heart's content. So very basic uh, demonstration of, of Blazor's capability there but hopefully something that gives you a picture of the richness uh, that you can sort of uh, experience with it and what you can what you can do on that side. Um, the, the the second thing I just wanted to walk through was um, how you might interact with a couple of Azure services so um, the first one I'll I'll pick on is um, I'll do the dangerous thing of logging into my Azure portal live. Um, so I've got a um, I've got a demo registration here, an app registration here, and so app registrations, as mentioned before, used for um, oh, I've got quite a bit of credit remaining. Um, <laughs> app registrations are used for uh, being able to authenticate applications. Uh, using the directory that you have in Azure Active Directory and that can be against either your directory or against any directory that's a uh, you know that's uh, that, that, that's that's known by Microsoft and really good really good way of ensuring you know for example that only people within your organization can get access to an application so I've set up a demo registration here very simple you know it's got a simple a single callback which as you can see is from my um, uh, from my Blazor application with sign in OIDC. Sign in OIDC is part of the um, is part of the uh, Azure AD middleware that is part of the uh, Microsoft Identity Platform. So uh, just that's why that's there. Um, I've set it up with this one redirect U uh, URI, and then I've shared uh, the necessary secrets with the uh, with, with the Blazor app, and just to show sort of how easy it is to set up. Uh, Azure, um, <clears throat> Azure Active Directory uh, authentication with a with a Blazor application. So this de this demo registration is set up. If I go to the overview, we'll see sort of the client and tenant IDs up here. And what I've then done is come in here, stuck those in my uh, in my app settings, um, and then uh, that's respected. Then and then in the startup file, very simply, in a very similar manner to we would do in you know, any other uh, ASP.NET core application. I've set up my uh, my middleware services, so adding Azure AD to the services collection, um, uh, to, 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 which which tells my application to use uh, Azure AD as the authentication scheme. Um, I've set up you know some basic pieces around sort of what the uh, what the authentication could should could do um, in here. You can also set up things like you know, requesting certain claims. So if you want your user to be able to interact with the Microsoft graph, you could come in here and you could add into um, options.scope. You could add in um, 
you know something like uh, user.read.all, which would give your you know give that user access to um, uh, the uh, user.read.all um, permission set within the Microsoft uh, within the Microsoft Graph, which would let you get all of their you know all of their user profile data. So useful things can be added in there, and then you set up you know an, an authorization policy that requires authenticated users, and finally you add. Uh, user authentication onto your app in the configure uh, in the configure piece of the startup uh, puzzle if you like and just those changes then mean that when I go into the application and I'll do it now in a uh, the private window so you sort of see the flow as soon as I go into the application then it triggers straight off that I need to sign in with my uh, with my FSP account uh, I won't won't do it live because it will ask me for MFA and all that good stuff but um it triggers triggers that flow and 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 then pushes me into the application and then I have you know I can get access to the claims principle in 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 the normal way that I would and you know whether you're using uh, you know SP.NET Core identity or something behind that to then uh, tie to uh, tie to your user database um, the the options are all open there but a very simple way again you know compared to again if you if you transpose this into the world of Using this now in in the WASM context, uh, you know you've got a very straightforward way of being able to do um, end user authentication um, compared to you know the pain that it is to use something like ADAL uh, .js or or, or MSAL .js uh, with 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 React. So really, really powerful, uh, really powerful um, tool and very very easy to use. Um, second piece I'll cover, I'm sort of conscious of time, is um, the uh, the upload capability. Um, so again, as mentioned, large file uploads can be uh, can be challenging uh, with Blazor uh, due to the sort of the chatty nature. So very sort of oh, show you all my uh, user uh, storage accounts. Apologies. Um, so very simple um, uh, demonstration of. Uh, the, the the capability here. So what I've got is a a simple Blazor page. Um, there is some um, some challenge to uh, if if you think about the nature of how Blazor works with the diffing that goes on. If you had the normal way of doing a file upload uh, would be to drop a input type equals file onto a web page, have a submit button, which then when submitted sends that whole as you know sends send that whole uh, file back to the server as part of the post request and yes you, you, you handle it in multiple ways but so you know the modern thing that we want to be able to do is one handle multiple file uploads but also be able to track the progress and of course the you know the the, the blazer model natively that post request if you're going to post as a form you'd have to post off to something like an mvc controller or a razor page in order to be able to receive that so not a very nice way of working. So what there is, um, I've used a, a an available um, an available uh, wrapper. Uh, although you can craft your own if you if, if you want. There's an available wrapper for the input file, which what it does is it wraps the necessary JavaScript to start sending packets uh, of the file through in an appropriate format back to the server, which means you can then stream them through. Um, so that that input file that's available on uh, on NuGet, um, and you can you know, pull through pull through that, uh, that that package and then then include that in your application. But there's 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 good there's there's a good blog online about sort of the um, uh, the the reasoning behind it, which I've got in my resources section in my uh, in my pack uh, later on. Um, as you can see, again in the normal way. Uh, using the you know the at to represent that I want to use you know this method to be called through to a um, through to a server side function. I'm calling the file upload method, and you see what I've done here with this file upload file is an alternative way when you've got small files of dealing with um, with 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 code in Blazor. You can have it in line in a in a code code block rather than having to refer off to a you know to a code behind file. E either will work. And then again, very simply, as part of that, I'm able to. Use the um, use the Microsoft Azure dot storage um, uh, assemblies. Um, plug in my storage credentials. Obviously, you know, in in good practice world, I'd be using uh, using a much more secure method of, uh, of 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 grabbing these. Plus, you know, we'd probably have different credentials for development versus uh, versus production environments, and so be grabbing that from from Key Vault or similar. Um, 
and then you know using um, using uh, the storage account uh, object and passing that in, and then I'm going in grabbing my grabbing my container, and I can stream the file straight through to um, uh, straight through to the uh, to the awaiting to the awaiting blob storage uh, environment. So what that looks like in practice is um, I'm able to choose a file here. Um, I'll choose my son's 12 meg movie. Hit upload. You'll see again. This might might interfere with my uh, with my with my uh, with my broadcasting connection. Never thought of that. Um, <laughs> um, hopefully it hasn't. Hopefully you can all still uh, hear and see me. Um, the as you can see the the files now uploaded fully. Um, Hopefully you saw along the way as it was going, it was counting up. Now again, really nice feature of Blazor. All I've got in here is a for each loop, which is going through each file and it's saying for each file, spit out the file name, the data position and the size. As that changes, as those data points, as those uh, as those properties of those objects change, it automatically updates the web UI as you saw. Um, it's a really nice feature. And what we'll see over here on, on the Azure Blob storage side is JoshuaMovie.mp4 is now dropped into this container, um, which which is where I've in where I've uh, uploaded it. So, um, really, really straightforward, um, really straightforward to do. And again, just demonstrate some of that power of Blazor in terms of working with working with Azure services. So um, that's everything from the sort of demo side of it. Um, plenty more could go into, but didn't want to do a big deep dive into Blazor. Um, so very quickly to to wrap up, then um, a little bit on. Um, Scaling Signal R. Um, so Signal R, the free tier, um, uh, the free tier provides you 20 connections max, whatever 20 connections max means, and 20k messages max per day. Again, similarly, um, and the standard tier goes in one to 100 units. So you can provision up to 100 units of this. A unit costs about 35 quid a month. Um, so not terribly expensive and you get 1000 connections per unit sounds pretty high uh, and 1 million messages per day per unit again sounds high don't know what it means so what does that mean in real life production use so i've taken these stats from um, one of our production systems that we run internally we do run this with uh, with clients with uh, with larger use cases and similar sort of impact this is a daily task allocation system that we use for our company um, that runs on it everybody hits this pretty much every day um, go on to find out what work they're meant to be doing. Uh, we use it for, uh, you know, for everything. For we use it for everything in terms of running our operation as a company. As you can see, each week there's sort of five spikes. Those represent sort of the five days, and clearly there's points of the day where people log on in the morning and towards the end of the day as they sort of update what work they've done and similarly. And so you, what you'll see is, you know, this is a highly concurrent system for 75 users. What we're seeing is, you know. For 75 users, we're hitting about 35 connections. So unfortunately, we've gone outside of the free tier, uh, but we've not, you know, we've not gone uh, anywhere near what the, you know, what the 35 pounds a month buys us. And uh, we could scale up to, um, you know, uh, 2,000 users in theory, um, and probably still be well within our, uh, or maybe 1,500 users, and be well within our connection limit. On the message count side, um, a bit more there, so you can see, you know, there's some different spikes, and and actually the the message spikes doesn't necessarily follow the uh, follow the user spikes. Um, so you can see, you know, uh, there's a particular spike in between the fifth and the twelfth there that doesn't sort of correlate to uh, to how many users we were seeing at that point. So can can be a number of reasons for that. That could be, you know, a single user having been logged into a session and just sort of flipping between different pages, doing a lot in there. So you know, we use we use this system for. You know, our uh, our resourcing team can go in and you know set up you know all of the work associated with the project. So it may have been, we had a very big project to load that day, and they were doing a lot of work in there, and so a lot of messages going uh, across, but may maybe not so many connections. And so again, gives us a picture of okay, well, we, you know, on a on a peak day, we're hitting 160,000. That looks like a pretty unusual day, uh, and we're not getting near our our million messages that were allowed per day. So we've probably got about you know. About five times the number of users we can scale on that front. So again, two different metrics. This is what it like looks like in 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 production for us for a fairly heavily transacted system. But um, yeah, and and as I say, we've we've extrapolated this to 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 other to 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 other places we've run it, and it and it runs in a pretty similar manner. 
So yeah, this is this is sort of what SignalR looks like in terms of scaling as a service. Um, it's a really useful service, but one that's probably a bit of a black box to many, but can be used in, in a lot of really clever ways as well as as, as well as Blazor. So last piece, uh, and I'll, I'll share these out afterwards um, in terms of uh, some follow up reading. Um, there's uh, serverless architecture with Blazor using the WASM model. Quite quite an interesting um, video uh, from from build 2019 to so build last year on you know, that sort of pattern of a Blazor WASM application talking to Azure functions, talking to Azure storage. Must caution you at this point, WASM, as I mentioned, is in preview. It's not ready for sort of enterprise prime time. Um, however, you know, the, the model definitely, uh, you know, is definitely one that Microsoft are pursuing and we would see, uh, you know, downstream WASM being, you know, a, a, a really sort of powerful application for Blazor. Uh, Chris Sainty's blog's really good on um, on on everything Blazor. Lots of in-depth articles on many 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 um, sort of different topics you might run across as a, as a developer or a, a user of Blazor. Love the awesome Blazor resources on GitHub that Adrian Torres has set up. Um, very good, and of course you can't have any follow-up reading without having Channel Nine on there. So lots of again lots of Blazor content on there that uh, are more than welcome to go and uh, look up in your in your in your spare time. But that's all I've got to present for now. Apologies for for running on a little bit a little bit longer. Um, Realised a lot of content to cover. Hope I kept it at a, at a level that was sort of interesting to everybody. But more than happy to take any any questions at this point. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tim. That was uh, really uh, good. Really Thank good. you very much for that great presentation. We had a couple of uh, Q and A come in during the talk, and uh, some of them are questions. Some are just sort of observations, really. Um, and uh, Panos had a couple that he was mentioning. He said that um, that he likes uh, all of the auth n and also code on the server, um, as well, along with the secrets to keep it out of the hands of mischievous. Uh, View source control or uh, Chrome Dev Tools kind of uh, hackers. Um, so, you got any observations around uh, how it affects the sort of security prospects of the developed code? Oh, absolutely. So clearly, in the WASM model, we've got to be much more careful in terms of what goes into the code and how we are interacting with um, with different resources. So, there's very specific ways of doing, for example, um, Azure AD authentication if you're doing it on the on the client side, as you. You know, if you've done anything with, uh, for example, a, um, a JavaScript framework application, uh, an SPA, interacting with uh, Azure AD, you'd be familiar with. Um, so there is a, a different way, and the, the the model having your data interactions off in either a functions app or, or at very least in an API. You know, in, in your choice of um, you know of method of, uh, of 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 creating an API. Um, is definitely the model for um, for if you're using the WASM uh, way of working, and would never recommend if you're you know, creating a WASM application that you um, uh, do anything. You, you, you know, you're you're interacting directly with your data sources from there because you'll have connection strings, etc., that will be that will be accessible. So you've got to be really conscious of security and work in the same way. So there are two different two different methods of interaction there. Yeah, Blazor server side definitely gives you a a, a, an easier option there because there there aren't any you know there there isn't that ability you are subject to the same security that you put around your 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 resources and as long as you're you follow good practice in that regard then you're safe. Cool, good answer, man. And um, he sort of follows up Panos again with a little bit of a cheeky one, um, saying that because um, because Blazor kind of locks you into SignalR as the the mechanism. Um, it maybe it would make sense for Microsoft to give you a discount if you're using SignalR just for a Blazor app. Um, <laughs> what do you think yeah, think about that? Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so in reality, you know, what, what I found is that the four uh, enterprise use cases. So, so Blazor on uh, the Blazor applications are very light on the app service. So you can generally run, you know, um, the load testing that we've done shows sort of on a on a basic, I can't remember exactly which SKU it is now, uh, but a pretty basic VM that was, you know, that is that is in the tens of pounds per month. Uh, you're talking about tens of thousands of users, that, or sorry, ten thousand users that can connect uh, and, and and use Blazor applications. So what you're probably reducing is you're reducing your app service footprint, but you're you're taking the cost on the signal of service. 
signal service is not particularly expensive expensive as you've seen clearly if you get to running 100 of those units you'd be spending three and a half grand a month which yeah it's definitely getting more you know getting more pricey but you'd be running a pretty big application with a lot of concurrency to be seeing that level of usage yeah absolutely um so anonymous hacker has asked uh, is it possible to interact with a graphical library such as webgl yeah 100 percent. so you can use uh so you can interact with any javascript library didn't go go into it today again just sort of figuring out what the audience is M more than happy to come back come back and do a, a deeper dive into blazer that was interesting but um yeah you can do interaction with uh, with javascript um and uh you know I, I, we've used libraries like d3 obviously uh, jquery no reason you couldn't use WebGL, you'd need to do a bit of wrapping of it uh, because of how WebGL interacts with certain um, certain elements uh, within the within the page. But for example, Chart.js has a really good um, existing uh, wrapper uh, and interacts with Canvas components through that. So it's, yeah, it's all it's all definitely possible. And if you've got canvases that you wanna you want to interact with using using something like WebGL, you can do. Okay, uh, Nick Bogier asked. Um, well, basically pointed out that you look nice and uh, it's nice when your face appears alongside your presentation, which more of a more of a compliment to me, but I thought I'd say it because, you know, it makes me feel good. Um, Martin Scher um, has said, um, for a new application, would you use Blazor ahead of Angular and React? Yes. Yes, he would. I, I, I would and I, uh, yeah, I mean, so, so there's definitely a piece of, you know, you've got to use the right tools for the job and there's, of course, you know, concerns like who's going to support it and is it, you know, if you're developing it for a client, is the client, you know, is it the right choice for a client? Is it in their strategic roadmap? But as a rule, you know, we, we are definitely leaning towards Blazor now as our primary uh, web development uh, web development tool. And uh, for me, it's uh, you know, there's definitely a workflow advantage and a uh, an advantage to onboarding certain types of developer that really helps. Good stuff. Um, then he goes on to ask, uh, does that mean, I think he means like architectural from a code architecture point of view, do you end up not having a controller layer? More like maybe an MVC kind of approach? Um, yes, yeah, good question actually. So you, you can, so you, you can build it, you can, you can architect your application in whatever way you want to, right? So you could architect your application in such a way that uh, you abstract all of your, um, all of your business logic off. You would still end up calling off to a controller then to build out, you know, the um, the, the structures that you had within your within your page to get maximum value out. Because if you if you moved all of your business logic out into controllers, what you'd end up is just having lots of static, lots of static Blazor pages, which you'd be pushing all of that off. So, um, I mean, you, you can do it. You you know, I think it, it leads to a slightly different paradigm. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, it's it's one of those where you. Um, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. I think there's there's cases where you encapsulate your business your business logic separately, and you could push that off to a controller where it makes sense. Um, but you know, in the main, you don't have as much need um, to to do that as you, as you not as much need. Yeah, the the paradigm doesn't lend itself to be used in that way so well. Okay, great stuff. Um, Mike says uh, it was a great presentation and. Uh, if he was using React today with ASP.NET Core APIs, more microservices, what's the unique selling point to move to Blazor? It's a great question, Mike. Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, I mean, you know, honestly, if you've got a team that really understands your application, there is no case to move to Blazor. That would be my, you know, my starting point. If it's well architected, it's working well for you. Why would you move? Um, however, um, I think th there is definitely a thing of, you know, not everyone is completely comfortable with um, with with, uh, with with JavaScript frameworks. Um, so some people are. Um, there's clearly, you know, there's a lot of moving parts with uh, with JavaScript frameworks. So we think about um, something like the jump between uh, I can't even remember the versions, but React pre React hooks and React post React hooks. Actually, you know, the big jump and a lot of rework that was needed, and probably a lot of input that was needed from very senior devs within your team. Um, not saying Blazor would not come out with the same paradigm shifting um, 
ideas, but certainly Microsoft's been pretty good in the past. You know, we look at how sort of the C sharp language has developed over a number of years and how you know uh, SP.NET developed, uh, MVC has developed. They're pretty good at incremental changes and keeping good levels of backward compatibility. So in terms of keeping pace, yeah, there's a there's a decent case there. I think having all of your uh, having all of your business logic code and front end code using same or similar objects, etc. There is a benefit there. Um, but yeah, once you're well established into using an application, you know, there's there's got to be a really good reason to change it. Yeah, I agree completely. Um, Martin Schur asks, um, do you still have an Azure web app in addition to the SignalR application? So you've got a app service. Um, so yes, yes, an app service sitting as part of an app service plan. So that's it. Yeah, it's a web app in effect. Okay, and then um, last question so far um, is uh, someone would like to know more about SignalR. Said it's a good introduction. Um, Okay. And either states or asks is running on or running on Linux is cheaper. So uh, as an observation, what can you say about the cross-platform nature of ASP.NET Core, Blazor and cost particularly? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So SignalR service, I don't think, uh, well, no, SignalR service I know doesn't have any option of changing what underlying VM, you know, ultimately all of these PaaS services have underlying VMs, doesn't have any option of changing the underlying service uh, VM. As we know, um, app services, you can choose whether you're running those on Linux and or or, or, or Windows. Um, there would be no, you know, there'd be a cost differential in that, uh, which is you know, built into the SKU pricing, not not massive, uh, can't, can't always recall all of those from, from memory. Um, but uh, yeah, there'd be, there'd be a bit of a, a, bit of a um, uh, a price differential. Um, we've not done any massive tests on whether the performance is any greater because I guess the, there's two sort of uh, metrics by which you'd save money. One is the ongoing cost of the VM, but then the second is if a Linux VM for whatever reason running ASP.NET Core um, could scale further than a Windows VM because potentially it's more lightweight or something. You know, there's there's, there's potential arguments in there. What I would say is given ASP.NET Core on um, on uh, Linux runs on top of Mono. Mono is, is, a, is a very, um, uh, is a very um, mature product um, and you know, has been, it's been around for many years, but there is still, you know, there's still a, a performance, they, well, I'll qualify what I say heavily, Last time I used it, there was a pre, you know, there was, there was a performance penalty around uh, around Mono, and so it's something to investigate. I'd suggest, but I don't know if you'd get a implicit improvement from just using um, from just using uh, uh, um, uh, a Linux Linux VM underpinning your app service versus Windows. Okay, and uh, last question thus far is um, from Panos again. Um, he asks you how has, has the maintenance been for your guys for your production estate um, and the deploy blazer app do you feel maintaining it is quicker and easier than an angular or react app because in the end all that matters from a business perspective is cost 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 <laughs> uh, yeah i guess to some extent that that is what matters um yes yeah, so the maintenance cycle has been really easy so um, what one thing we didn't touch on, you know, again from a from an app dev perspective, another great feature. Not you know, not to say that um, you know, there aren't good JavaScript testing frameworks because there are, but again, your your tests, um, you know, it, when you're when you're running, you know, when you're running a, a project, your unit tests can all be uh, written in you know, written in C sharp using you know, whatever your uh, your test framework of choice is, MS test or whatever else, um, and as such can be you know, integrated into your CI chain. In the production environments that we're running, we have automated um, pipelines, um, both for, uh, for, for CI CD to, um, to, to test environments, but also for continuous deploy to production with an approval loop, which is a pretty nice feature. So um, it, it can either be manually triggered or triggered off a, off a particular change. So if you have a, if you're running a, a feature branching pattern that has your production running on master, then you can trigger off changes on master. If you're running that off tags, you can you, know, you manu manually trigger against a tag and then and then push that up. 
But what that will do is then a dev or a um, or, or a, another person in your organization or, or, or a maintainer of code trigger a production release, but it go through an approval, a number of approval steps before that. So a, you know, a test lead, for example, could approve it that they've you know, tested it in the test environment first, and then a service operations manager could approve it and you know, say that they're happy that it goes in you know, as part of a change request. So um, the maintenance has been pretty simple and thinking about, yeah, you could do all of those things with a with a with a React application, but the tool chain that you're doing with is a consolidated tool chain. And you know, one of the things Richard and I were talking about just before just before this session was, you know, when it comes to integration of a product set and integration of a way of working, Microsoft does really well there. And the development tool chain integration is brilliant when it comes to this. OK, well, that's it for the questions at the moment. Thank you all very much for that. Um, I just wanted to wonder whether you had any uh, final comments to wrap up with there, uh, Tim? <laughs> um, I think I think the best question was, would you always use Blazor? You know, I think I think the answer is yes. But no, uh, I think it's you know it's an awesome new technology. I think the, it you know, opens up the door to you know doing more with Azure, uh, uh, particularly and 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 you know, being being creative about how we use Azure services. And I think it's actually a really good point on the Signal service. It's probably worth uh, you know worth having a session on 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 that at some point by by someone because the signal mm -hmm. in terms of being able to do those WebSocket connections and do rich interactions is, is really powerful. So um more than happy for anybody to reach out. Um contact details um are on the slides and uh, more than happy to connect, answer questions over email, LinkedIn, Twitter, wh whatever you like. So yeah, uh, thank thanks for hosting Richard and uh, hope hope it was valuable to people. Pleasure. Pleasure. Really good talk. Um yeah, thank and, you so much. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And like Tim says, if any of you guys want to reach out to him directly and uh, uh, ask him any questions, then please do. Uh, what I'll do after this session is just post the meetup email, also the recording onto um, onto our YouTube channel and send all the links out. Um, just a quick reminder to anybody who hasn't dropped off already. Um, we do have, um, we've got a Microsoft um, uh, product group speaker from Azure Data Explorer um, on the 11th of May and uh, should be should be an interesting session. So um, if anybody wants to take a look at Meetup and uh, come to that session, um, it's the principal program manager of Custo, so uh, should be quite good. Um, and thanks everybody for joining us tonight and thank you, Tim. Thanks and thank. Sorry, Andy, for calling you Richard. I've just realised. <laughs> uh, no problem. Thank you for a great talk. Thank you very much. And uh, to everyone else who's still out there, hope you're all keeping safe and well. And we'll see you all again at another UK Azure user group. Thank you all. Thank you.